Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Today is part two of the How Bob and Richard Learned to Gamble segment. Uh, We taped an earlier one, and now we're doing a second half of that. We ended up last time pretty much with me getting kicked out of playing blackjack. Did you have any more blackjack stories that you wanted to add to it, or should we move on to my career in video poker? Well, I mean, we stopped sort of at the very beginning of my blackjack uh, career. Then uh, let's keep going. You know, uh, no, I mean, I, I uh, why, why don't we move into video poker? I mean, because there must have been a gap, right, between your stopping blackjack and video poker arriving in Las Vegas? No. The video the video po- My I moved to Vegas in 93 to be a blackjack player. So oh, the that f- late? So the first time I was playing it was uh in the early 80s during a million dollar backgammon tournament and I would make several trips from Los from Los Angeles to Las Vegas which was either an an hour plane flight or a five-hour drive depending oh so you were working at a job again i i actually had a job and uh trying to support myself and eventually when backgammon died out in los angeles and the uh the the job merged the company merged and so there were did away with a lot of duplicate positions I suppose I was the least effective in the duplicate position, so I got. So at that point, all I was doing financially was um, teaching country western dancing a couple nights a week for like fifty dollars a night, and so that was all. That, that was my source of income and, and unemployment. I really wanted to move to Vegas, and uh, but I wanted a partner. And so I kept trying to find a girlfriend who thought that would be an interesting way to spend her. As opposed to try to find a girlfriend here in Vegas. You wanted to find one there first and then move here. I guess I thought it was, I mean, one of my hobbies was dancing. And I had, there were a lot of girls in the dancing world. And I thought, I, I want, and I wanted to keep dancing. It was a whole lot easier, from my point of view, is to take a dancer and teach her how to be a partner in gambling than it was to take somebody who already gambled and teach her dancing. No, I meant you could have moved here and found a dancer. There are certainly a lot of dancers here in Las Vegas. That's true. I, 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 I was, my thought at the time was the ladies I would meet in Las Vegas would have too many bad gambling habits. And so the ones who wanted to hook up would already know how to play in their mind and uh, wouldn't treat me as the expert and the boss. And I was pretty sure I had studied more than almost any of them. And I wanted a relationship where, at least in the gambling part of the relationship, I could be the boss and I could be the, um, the head guy. So I moved here in 93. And by 94, I was pretty much run out of places to play blackjack. So uh went to gambling bookstore, gambler's bookstore, looked for gambling games that I could learn that where I would have an edge because I really didn't want to go get a job. And I was willing to work very hard so I wouldn't have to go get a job. And I tried live poker and was not good at it. Um, I like sports, but I didn't have any computer access. And so getting good at sports handicapping without computers, I didn't think that was a, I couldn't see a path there and uh, video poker, maybe. So, so there were already books on video poker. Yeah, the there was, uh, not good books. I was going to say there wasn't much, right? I there, mean, 
Wong wrote a book, right? Wong's book, A Professional Video Poker. And I had a lot of respect for Wong in the uh, from the blackjack world. And his professional video poker was about how to play 8-5 jacks or better progressive machines. Oh, and okay. it was a very simplified strategy for that. Did Mike Carroll have a book, too? I don't think Mike Carroll had a book. Uh, Lenny Fromm had simplified strategies for all games. So each each uh, page of his you know 100-page book had a different game with a different strategy on it. Uh, Dan Paymar had a book. Dan Paymar wrote the same book like 10 times. And every uh, year or so, he would update it with the uh, the same thing. So he just kept the same book, and he just published it 10 times. And uh, although sometimes the strategies would get a little bit better from time to time. And um, there was a Joker Wild book out. Bradley Davis uh, wrote that. So those were the books. So I looked, and I wasn't impressed with the, the books. But, of course, that was my source of knowledge. Did not have a computer program. And so I started, I found some good games in Vegas where players had the advantage, just with the knowledge I had. I talked my way into being one of Stanford Wong's scouts. Stanford Wong... Blackjack Scouts. He had current Blackjack News. And he needed scouts for to go in and every month look at the machines, look at the games, how many decks, how many tables were open, uh, what the rules were. And so he'd publish that. So I had a particular route and became friends with him, which was... He, w- he brought me his video poker programs there were two of them uh they were both very rudimentary one uh i think it was called vp exact his whole job was to find out what the return of a game is so if you want to put in nine six jacks or better pay schedule and come back eight hours later it would come out with 99.54 and and a couple extra time and his, uh, I think it was Video Poker Tutor might have been the name of his video poker program. And so there on Deuces Wild, it would, you ha- flushes and straights had to pay the same for it to work. Uh, now at that time, Full Pay Deuces, which was the main game, did have the same. So it worked perfectly for for that. But when games came out where flushes paid 15 and straights paid 10, didn't work so well. So there were other programs that had to come. But he, uh, and he gave me some black, blackjack programs as well. So I actually bought a computer so I could use these discs that Stanford Wong gave me. And that was, that was, using computers was a, was a good deal for me. Now, the way I worked out strategies back then was I'd start with what was written. So I'd compare the strategies that Lenny Fromm had and that Dan Paymar had line by line, noticing where the differences were. And I would start to play the game and and guess what? And the machine would correct me when I was wrong. And every time it got a case where one of those cards were wrong, I would write that hand down and eventually I would develop the patterns. There were cases where Fromm was more accurate than Paymar, some where Paymar was more accurate than Fromm, and some that they both had wrong. Uh, And of course, most of it they both had right. And so sometimes the hands that I checked it would lead me to the wrong conclusion. At this time, I had no idea what penalty cards were. And so, like, in, with a queen ten of hearts and an ace of spades, in jacks are better, sometimes you hold the queen ten and sometimes you hold the ace queen because of those other two cards. I did not understand that at the time, and so 
if I was practicing and I'd get the wrong hand, well, I'd write that down. But then sometimes it would go the other way. So I was pretty sure Wong's program didn't work. And so it took a while to figure out what was all, what was happening. Uh, and then I would just play. You know, I, I have to say, like for people now, you have this ease that the programs are accurate and you can just get the information so easily and so instantly and so, yeah instantly even in the casino right if you have a phone you can just google it or whatever uh never mind that that's a felony but go on richard well not if you're not at the machine when you do it right oh okay you know but uh, but when you don't have the information is when there's more money to be made when everybody has the instant information that's not going to be as good an opportunity as when not everybody has the information and it's harder to derive. Correct. The games today are much, 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 much tighter than they were then. But the information available is much, 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 much more. So um, there's a trade-off. And so there's still 5 or 10% of the players make real good money playing video poker and that was true back then and it's true today but the the skill level of the players today is a whole lot higher than it was back then same in blackjack the um so i would play and i would write down so i decided i was going to write some books on this so i started to write books because about where my strategy was just so much better than what Paymore had done or what Fromm had done or any of the other authors, or certainly Wong who didn't even cover 96 Jacks, and put it together for a few different games and tried to get it published by Anthony Curtis. Anthony Curtis, then and now, was the publisher of the Las Vegas Advisor and Huntington Press and I had submitted a few articles to him in the past that he ran an LVA or a few items and he thought I had a sense of humor and so he was he was looking forward to a uh, to a good book on video poker but he could not find a way to edit my workbooks into making it into something he thought he could sell so he struggled with it for more than a year of, and finally just gave it back to me. He says, I can't do anything with it, which was um, devastating to me. Mm. Did you try Gambler's Book Club? They published books back then. Um, didn't get that far. Um, a friend of mine named Jeffrey Compton suggested that he and I together self-publish them and make them into $10 kind of pamphlets one for jacks are better one for deuces wild and one for double bonus and somehow i uh anthony and i got past that and be later became friends again but i was mad at him for a while and so Just for reaching the wrong decision or, or for taking too long to well taking an a year and a half to do it yeah. and i felt um i felt cheated I felt like, okay, if if you're going to refuse it, like, do it right away. But he told me all along, we're going to do this. It's just a little bit more. I'm going to take a little bit more time. That's what I mean. We're going to do this. And then all of a sudden, can't do it. So, um, and, you know, he had his own pressures at the time. And uh, there's no, I don't want to imply that there's any kind of lasting grudge because there isn't. The... Uh, one of the smartest things I did was, as accidental, I sat next to this uh, man and his wife uh, who were playing, and they were using somebody else's strategy. And uh, I told them my strategy was better. I had a copy in my car. So I went, 
you know, took a 10 minute walk to my car and 10 minute walk back, gave him one of them, they charged him $10 for. And of course, as far as they were concerned, that was real cheap. And it was, and the guy's name was Bill Day. And he decided to write under the name of, of Liam W. Daly, which happens to be the letters of William Day anagrammed. And so Liam was among the very smartest of people that I ever met. He had a PhD from Oxford University, which is over in uh, Cambridge, which is outside London, and uh, worked on several impressive things. And he and I formed a partnership of... uh, coming out with strategy cards and winner's guides, which lasted five or six years. And I learned as much from this back and forth with Bill Day than I'd ever learned on my own. So he was able to systematize penalty cards into a way that was a lot clearer than what I had in my original reports and was able to enunciate exactly when certain things happened that I hadn't made clear before. And when he said it, it's, oh, yeah, great. So uh, players who read my stuff know about straight flush threes, plus one, zero, minus one, and minus two. That was his invention. And if you uh, don't know what I'm talking about, buy my books the uh it's a way of simplifying uh three and four card straight flushes to make the strategies much much easier uh so that was a huge difference in my life just my relationship with bill and it um i was able to talk my way into writing for several different publications through the years i wrote for I opened up Strictly Slots and Casino Player and worked there until the uh, the managing editor died, and I'm fine. And uh, his brother kept it going and uh, forgot to pay me for several months and uh, denied that he owed me money. So I finally gave him a few choice words and ended my relationship with him. You know, you're you're mentioning that uh, that meeting with Bill Day. I, I when people ask me about, you know, becoming a trying to gamble for a living, I tell them that the two most important factors of how successful you're going to be are how strong a work ethic you have and how large your social network is those are the two most important things not necessarily how large but does it include mentors or does it include people who are really good in what you're yeah, doing yeah 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 and i i think though i mean the reason i say large is because the larger you cast the net the more likely you are to connect to somebody who can be really knowledgeable or helpful or whatever Yeah, and the reason I'm disputing that a little bit is because I have a large number of contacts in the dancing world. They don't help me play video poker one little bit. Oh, no, I'm talking about your contacts Yeah, who are doing the thing you're trying to do. Yes, that's true. So you've told several times of uh, you got to go to Europe with a guy named Daryl, and that was a life-changing thing for you. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, so uh, that same friend of mine, the one who came and said, you have to, you, you have to get back into blackjack, um, he, he came to me one day and he said, oh, I think I'm going to have to go to Europe with Daryl. Now, now I, should, I should preface this with, I mentioned before that Vegas was a small town and all the blackjack players knew each other and... Uh, So uh, Daryl was not a player on our team. Daryl was, you know, part of the Ken Houston team, and then he had branched off with some of the other guys, and they had their own team. And we would have these blackjack parties, and it would be 
blackjack players from all different teams, and maybe somebody would be able to convince a woman to come to the party or two, other than Cat Holbert, who was already a blackjack player. And you, right away, we would make these rules. You're not allowed to talk about casinos or blackjack, because it was just the most boring party imaginable for any woman that was not a blackjack player. Uh, and we were never very successful at this. The, the conversation immediately devolved into blackjack. But anyway, so we knew the other teams. And Daryl, at that time, had a shuffle tracking computer that he was going to go out with, and they were looking for investment. And so our team, some of the guys on our team and some of the other teams were going to put up money for their bankroll for, for them to go out and play with this shuffle tracking computer. So um, so my friend says, oh, I think I'm going to have to go to Europe with Daryl. And I was like, uh, what, are, what are you talking about? He was like, well, Kat Holbert, he was dating Kat at the time. Um, she thinks somebody should go, you know, sort of keep an eye on things with Daryl. Because Daryl was not the most responsible guy when it came to sort of normal everyday things like, you know, leaving a grocery bag full of cash in his doctor's office because he forgot it there, you know, with $100,000 in it. Um, so so Kat thought that somebody should go keep an eye on Daryl and the money. And I said, so you're complaining that the, the team is going to pay for this trip, right? And he said, yeah. I said, so you're unhappy that you might have to go on an all-expenses-paid trip to Europe to play blackjack? And he said, yeah, why? Would you want to go? I was like, uh, yeah, I could take that over for you. Because uh, he had been, I, no, you know, I was in my early 20s. I had never been to Europe. He had been to Europe. He was a chess, you know, uh, chess master and had done a lot of traveling. So uh, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Um, so... I went to Europe with Daryl, and we traveled around, had various adventures. And um, after that was my first retirement from blackjack. That's when I moved to Los Angeles to get involved in, you know, the movie business. And uh, and to take my money at back uh, uh, Yeah. Well, no, I think that had been earlier, actually. But anyway... I, when I went back to Blackjack a couple of years later, rather than kind of calling my old teammates, I called Daryl because we had had such a good time traveling around Europe. And, and his attitude about Blackjack was a uh, polar opposite of my old team. Uh, my old team, we had very strict rules about everything. Uh, you know, uh, not only did... It, it, on the old team, if you wanted to go play in Reno, you had to pay your own expenses to get there and back, right? It, it wasn't a team expense. So the team paid for absolutely nothing, and, um, you know, and you could never bet any cover, and you could never tip, and uh, whereas, you know, Daryl's team, it was the opposite. They paid the, for the plane fare, uh, you know, an argument could be made to, for your dry cleaning if you needed your suit in the to get into the casino or whatever. So anyway, as I say, when I got back into it, I called Daryl and really have kind of been playing with him for the last 30 years. So, um, yeah, that was uh, that was a kind of a big turning point, too. So there's, there's actually a lesson here of uh, get lucky and meet the right person. Yeah, and you know, I have to tell you, when a couple of years later, when I uh, when I made that call to Daryl, I had discovered through Gambling Times magazine, and and I don't remember where else. At that time, they were opening a new casino in Aruba, and they were going to have single deck. Now, I saw this in some little tiny ad in Gambling Times magazine, and at the same time, I found out that in Curacao, which is the island right next to Aruba that uh, they had early surrender. So I wanted to go play those two games, and I called Daryl, and he was like, let's go, right? Um, so I called him back, and I said, you know, I got tickets. We're leaving like three weeks. He's like, three weeks? Why, why are we going in three weeks? I was like, well, the flights are ridiculously expensive, right? So if I book the flights now, they're like $1,000 a piece, and 
in three weeks, they're like $400. He's like, we might be playing games that are worth $1,000 an hour, and you want to save $600 on air, air tickets? I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Now, on the old team, I mean, we would have waited the three weeks, you know. But anyway, so, yeah, it was a, it was a big shift in my thinking about how to approach those things, so. And I, I think we made a really good team, actually, because because I was sort of more conservative by nature about those kind of things, and he was more, you know, he doesn't care about the money at all, you know what I mean? So uh, so I think we make, we make a very good team. Let's hear from our sponsors. The South Point has more than 10,000 games, returning more than 99%. This is more than anybody else has. There are two separate casino-wide progressives running at all time this month. The larger begins at $10,000 and must be hit by $25,000. All players playing with the club card are eligible to win. If you aren't the lucky one who connects on the progressive, but you are playing at the time with your club card inserted, you will receive $25 in free play. The smaller progressive begins at $1,000 and must be hit before 2500. It is scheduled to be hit three times per day throughout the month. Next week's free video poker class, Wednesday, October 12th, is the last class in the semester. It's called Secrets of a Video Poker Winner. This has nothing to do with how to play the hands, but rather how to win. We'll discuss common misconceptions, my views on money management, bank or requirements, dealing with the IRS, and how to improve your game. Everyone at least 21 years of age is welcome. At videopoker.com, it's the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to get correction on most of the games. Game of the week is 10 Play Ultimate X. Ultimate X is a 10 coin per line game where every time you win a hand, you earn multipliers that are, are in effect next hand. At this year's G2E Gaming Show, there were two variations on Ultimate X, both created by VideoPoker.com. We're going to be discussing those games and others very soon when we talk about that show. Now, let's go back to Richard and me. Getting things out of time sequence a little bit. Uh, now in video poker, I'm kind of like the mentor to people, whereas earlier Bill Day was my mentor. The I teach classes and have helpers to pass out the material and uh, sell the products and set up the room and those kind of things. And I don't pay them, although we do take them to lunch on a casino comp afterwards but I do allow them to ask me basically any question they want about gambling or anything else so some of those have asked me dozens and hundreds of questions how would you go about this how would you go about that and this is just part of the deal and of course I'm learning from their questions too but um and after three or four years they generally say this was good and now been to all your classes five times and I'm ready to go do something else on my Wednesdays or or whatever and so um so there's a turnover and so several of them who have been my helpers for a number for more than for two years or more are now very successful gamblers and their video poker skills are much, much higher than they were when they started just by this mentoring process. So finding yourself a mentor is important. Yeah. Well, you know, we talked about my son briefly, who uh, uh-huh. is starting to play a little bit of video poker. And, um, you know, it's one thing to learn the game, but then the the, the big question, where do you go play? <laughs> you know, where should I play? I mean, you know, given, uh, and I mean, I can help him a little bit cause I know you and I can ask you, but yeah. I'm not the video poker guy, you know? So, um, 
Yeah, actually feels good. I get to mentor Richard on video poker, and that feels pretty good. I've learned so much listening to him as a co-host here on the show about other games. And so now he has video poker. I'm just more than willing to help him with anything I know. And it actually is, um, feels good to uh, to be the be the mentor to Richard on gambling. Okay. So yeah, uh, I can help him with blackjack and uh, uh, and other casino games, but uh, you know, video poker. Other than you know, get him the software and you know, answer those kind of questions. But to me, that's the easy part about video poker, right? Is learning to play the game. Um, figuring out how to make money on it is the is the harder part I, to me. Yeah, the um, and your son, who's uh, in his twenties, it's a different game than it would be for you, because a lot of the best promotions, at least in Vegas, are seniors promotions, and if you're over fifty or at some places over fifty five you have considerably more options, profitable options, good options, than you do if you're under 55. Now, I don't recommend your uh, son rush to these, the 30 years before he gets there because it's a whole lot of good living in those 30 years and he should enjoy the process. But uh, he won't be eligible for those for a long time. Right. And he also doesn't have bankroll either, really either, you know, which means... Uh, some of these things are going to take him a lot more hours to get in the amount of play he needs to get than it would take me or someone else, you know, uh, that has that has more of a bankroll. Uh, I haven't cleared this question with you yet, so I don't really know the answer, and we, you may want to delete this. But um, you have the bankroll that you could subsidize any kind of gambling that you thought was good for him to do. Should you want to, there are giving him the money has pluses and minuses. So how did you work out whether he's got to get his own money to do it or you're going to be a financial partner in all his gambling? How did you work that out? Um, When it comes to table games, um, I... Because I know so much more about it, and and, and some those kind of opportunities, I am more than willing to bankroll. Just because I feel much better about those opportunities. Uh, to me, video poker is really kind of a grind, you know. So so uh, it absolutely is a grind. Yeah, and and so I mean. I've included him on opportunities where he can go out and play a table game with me and earn two, three, five hundred dollars an hour, and I'm willing to bankroll that. And and if he were to get into a hole, he would earn it back, you know, before he got a cut or whatever. Um so yeah, I'm I'm fine with that. But um especially if he's just starting out, which he is uh, I'm not willing to go have him take fifty, seventy thousand dollars swings at video poker. Um, you know, I'm I'm just not. Now, if he starts playing video poker and logs a lot of hours doing it, so that I feel, I mean, I I feel like if he's if he's played a hundred hours of jacks or better in the casino, I'm gonna feel very confident about his ability to play it correctly. Um, I mean, and I can test him at home if I want. Now, let's say that he came to me and he said, hey, I found a uh, jacks are better progressive, you know, uh, that's $25 coin and the, you know, uh, jackpot is at this. Well, yeah, I might, uh, then I might be more than willing to bankroll something like that, you know, Uh, but not just to go out and grind. And, you know, I want him to pay his dues, you know, play your single line $1 coin and move up to $2 coin and, and, uh, $1 coin in, which is, you know, $5 a hand is, is not a typical starting point. Most players start for quarters or lower. Well, you know, so so he has some bankroll. He has had the benefit of 
playing table games. <laughs> so he does have somewhat of a bankroll already. Mm-hmm. You know, so he can't start it at one dollar coin. And actually, he could probably start it too, but I didn't tell him that. <laughs> you know, so uh, you know, so yeah, he's he's uh, he's starting at one, and and uh, but he doesn't seem to be out there pounding the pavement. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't noticed him in my classes either. Yeah. Right, right. Although I had, well, I told him to just focus on one game to start. You know, just start with Jacks are better. So you only have one class and Jacks are better, right? So. Yeah, well, he wasn't there either. Yeah. But uh, the next semester is going to start probably in January. And even if he's on his second game at that time, it would probably be a good idea for him to attend the whole semester, assuming he's in Vegas and didn't have other commitments on those days. I don't know if he's working or I don't know what what else he's doing. The You know, I should say people ask me like, oh, well, what count did you tell him to use, right? <laughs> They're not going to like my answer. <laughs> my answer was do not count cards. <laughs> do not count cards. That is not where the money is anymore in, in uh, I mean, there are people who make a living counting cards. I think it's a very difficult way to make a living, and I think there are much better opportunities than counting cards. But but as I say, there is money to be made. You know, it's just I think he has the benefit of, of my mentoring and, and can find much better games. There is a lot of value in having a clean name. Having a name that is not in any of the databases, uh that has value. Now, it might be a number of years before that value shows up, but um, but just I'll give you a perfect example. Years before Don Johnson played, uh, there was an opportunity for me to play crafts with a 20% loss rebate Ooh. for enormous money at... I believe a hundred, I think it was a hundred times, no, maybe it was ten times odds. So I could play craps with ten times odds. I think it was a $2,500 line bet, the $25,000 odds. And I was, I, and they were going to give me a 20% loss rebate. Ooh. And the problem was. There's a bankroll problem. No, I, I had, you know. Enough. Or enough bankers. Well, I, I had backers. Yeah. You know, but the problem was, if I showed up with a million dollar credit line, or 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 even a million dollars in cash, or whatever, um, I actually I think the cutoff was only two hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's how ridiculous this was. I you had to win or lose two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and get a twenty percent loss rebate, and you could bet twenty five hundred on the line with twenty five thousand dollar odds. Right. Wouldn't take long. No, to... it wouldn't. Not long at all. So and and you know you could stop. You know after whatever an hour and come back the next week or whatever. I mean it was it was a ridiculous proposition. But the problem was, I said, look, if I show up with a million dollars or whatever it is, they're going to run my name. They're going to find out who I am, and they're not going to let me play. I mean, I just know that for a fact. And 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 when you're dealing with that kind of money, my financial backers were, were willing to say, yes, we trust you with this million dollars to go in and do this, but we're not going to trust somebody we don't know. You know what I mean? And, and so the whole thing kind of fell apart. So, there, you know, that's a case where a clean name would have been worth a lot of money in, in that situation. Yeah, I have I have that problem as well. Yes, right, right, exactly. And and I mean, if you were to go play, say, a progressive, let's say there was some, you know, progressive with a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollar jackpot. I mean, just the fact that you were playing that would that be enough, maybe, to, to for them to bar you uh, if they saw you playing it? Or I guess it would depend on the casino. Yeah, in my case, my, I'm going to call it fame, I don't know if that's the right word, uh, notoriety something, 
it cuts both ways. Some casinos uh, like to have me in there. They're a little bit nervous about it, but they know I write about the places I play and that other readers who they think are not as good as me as a player will say if if that casino is good enough for Bob Dancer, it's good enough for me. And so just the fact that they might lose however much to me, but they'll more than make up for it by me writing about it and letting other players know, yep, this is a good place to play. Other casinos want no part of that. Right. They, um, Since I write, I've proven to them that I'm competent and they would rather have their players barefoot and pregnant than to be knowledgeable. So, um, I mean, Station Casinos doesn't want any part of me, basically for that reason. South Point, uh, Michael Gon clearly knows who I am. I teach classes there, and he's been on the show. And he thinks overall it's good for his business that I uh, I say nice things about his casino, which is which which I need to tell the truth, and that's that's fine. There's enough good things there that I can talk about. So uh, different casinos have different aspects. I have to say one of the benefits of this show and that kind of notoriety um, is I really, uh, I think it gives me a level of safety. I think if I were to walk into a, a place and they were to recognize me, I don't think I'm going to have the shenanigans that a lot of people would would have, you know, I'm not going to get, probably not would, uh, I'm probably not going to get dragged to the back room or handcuffed or any of that kind of stuff, you know what I mean? Um, sometimes people see me and they know it's me and they'll just sort of smile and say, no, nah, you're not going to play, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? And I always say, no, no, I'm just here to eat, you know. Can you give me a comp? And of course they can't anymore. In the old days they could, you know. Yeah, that's um, the fame of Nora. Although partly it would kind of be good if they backroomed backroomed you and hand, handcuffed you, and because you know how to you know how to get money from them if they do that. You know, when but when you talk to the people that that's happened to, even the ones who've had big settlements, they almost always say, "Was it worth it?" No, <laughs> you know. I mean, it takes years, years of. You know, and you don't always win. And you don't always win, right? So, uh, yeah, I, I have not had. When I get kicked out, it's I get kicked out gently. Uh, so, which is a, uh, which is a nice benefit to have. Um, one of the areas that makes some of our listeners uncomfortable is I have been willing to talk to casino management more than most players do. I have taken the attitude that uh, the casinos are the AP's friend, not their enemy. If a casino isn't making money, there's no place for the APs to get money. So... So when uh, Ravel went down a couple of years ago, the uh, the GM had called me before they were doing this 100% loss rebate up to $100,000 or something. And he asked, and he was bragging to me about it. And I said, um, it's a terrible idea. And Richard asked on the air, why on earth would I tell him that? Because so, from Richard's experience, he knows lots and lots and lots of players. So this is the kind of promotion that they exploit. And my response was, if the casino goes bankrupt, that doesn't do anybody any good. And uh, how much that promotion led to the bankruptcy, I don't know. It certainly helped it go in that direction. Uh, it's coming back to life again next year. 
in a reincarnation. I have no prediction as to how long the reincarnation is going to last. Are they, they're coming back as 10, right? They're coming That's back as 10. Are, is it still going to be a casino? I think oh. so. Oh, I thought I saw one article that said it was coming back as a without a casino. But maybe I'm confusing it with one of the others. Could be. I'm not positive on that. Uh, Seems like Bo Derrick's agent should be on the phone while trying to get her a job. I would think so. Although, uh, Bo Derrick was a 10 a few years ago. The uh, I was closer to a 10 back then, too. Uh, I, I suppose I'm a 70 now. I don't know. Is, is that 10, 7 times as good as a 10? Um, so, talking to casinos was actually a learning experience for me. The I have gone into casinos and told them they knew who I was, they recognized the name, and I said, you know, allow me to play and I can help you. And so some casinos, the first thing they asked me is, well, you know, is is Richard Munchkin a good video poker player? And I go, well, let's. That question is not going to be answered. Um, and somebody ask you that? Not you, but other people. Oh, 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 I see. Yeah, they would ask me about other names that I don't want to put on the air. Is this player any good, or is he just lucky? And frequently, I'll know the player. Sometimes I don't. And I go, that's the level of question I, I'm not going to get into. I have to. Uh, You'll have to make that judgment yourself. But uh, I've helped design promotions at casinos where a good promotion is uh, going to be good for the players and good for the casinos. They want some kind of... When casinos get really burned by promotions, and that definitely happens. They'll go out and it sounds like a good idea and they'll put it out there and within the first few hours just tons of AP show up and beat the crap out of them and they get really gun shy and casinos get leery about offering promotions because they don't know if they're going to get creamed or not. You would think they would be able to figure out that you could hire someone to tell you, right? But, well, but actually that's what you're doing. You're helping that's try to design that promotion for them. Yeah, and there's compensation involved. Yeah, and, but I mean, you're going to design a promotion where the players can make money, just not destroy the place. Yeah, so uh, so the grinders can make money. You know, possibly the top ones could get fifty dollars an hour or something. Mm-hmm. And but it's there's not going to be that a whole bunch of people can make two thousand dollars an hour. Yeah. And so uh, if a casino announces a promotion that's going to last for a week and they have to cancel it after three days that's no good for um although the the players are if they have to cancel after three hours uh that's not good for the casino and they they will usually overreact the other direction now one of the advantages that i got out of this was a casino named ameristar asked me to check out their casinos all over the country and basically shop them and their neighbors. So they had casinos in northern Nevada, in um, Kansas City, in St. Louis. Saint, yeah, St. Charles, which is right next to St. Louis, and uh, Council Bluffs and Vicksburg. And so these are areas I had never been in before. And so I would go and I said, and their main competition at that point was Harris. And at all the location, there was whenever there was a Maristar, there was a Harris there too, although um, not in uh, not in Jackpot, which is in northern Nevada, and uh, not in Blackhawk, which came around after they stopped using me. So I got to go to these places and study the inventory in cities that I'd never been to before. So I became knowledgeable about the inventory in casinos all over the country, which was a huge asset that, um, cause I was basically paid to, t- 
do scouting. Scouting is so, 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 so important, but it can be boring as hell. And usually when you go out, you don't find anything great. And so you have to force yourself to go out with new eyes all the time. And when I was, uh, for some reason, when I was being paid for it, it was easier. Uh, And uh, although it would have been worth doing that for free because of the information that I got. So whenever you can, go scouting. It was, um, I didn't realize it until I got paid to do it. And then, wow, this is important. And scouting is important is one of the things you have to learn to, to be an AP. When, yeah, when I said earlier the two most important things are, you know, your, how hard you work and, and how big your circle is, um, scouting is just a huge part of that. I mean, for, I mean, if you're counting cards, a lot of times you can just go to a casino and sit down at a table and play. But for people who look for other opportunities, you may scout four to one, five to one, or more. You know, spend four or five times more time scouting than you ever do playing. Um, So, yeah, it's still... And, and, you know, the problem is that many people don't scout properly. Maybe they haven't been trained, so they don't know enough to know that you have to look at more than just the blackjack games and what the rules are. I mean, I, I... guilty actually i mean i go scout a casino and somebody asks me you know what are the blackjack rules and i have to say i have no idea it's just not one of the things i scout at all um it's just not even on my radar so so what do you scout that you can tell us about without revealing what you don't want to reveal well i would say i I look at probably every single game in the casino. Every single table game. Every single table game, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not looking for progressive slots. I'm not looking at video poker. If I'm there, I'm usually looking at the table games. Because, I mean, because you just never know. Um, You know, you don't know if you go look at the roulette table if they've come up with some new side bet you know, that no one's ever heard of before. Or, you know, they are, like in the New York Times article, they come up with some goofy way to deal craps, you know. So, yeah, I look at every every table. And how much of what you're looking for is the new rules and games, and how much is sloppy dealers? It's both. It's both. I mean, it's it's new rules, new procedures, new bets. Because you know they've come up with all these side bets now on all different games. Um, so yeah, it's it's both. But in video poker, well, in blackjack, if you know how to play blackjack, you know how to play blackjack. Yes, single deck has a different basic strategy than double deck has a different basic strategy than four decks. And whether or not you hit on soft 17 or not has different strategies. But basically, if you know how to play one of them, you can do reasonably well at any of them. Video poker, that's not true. You can play, I mean, the skills for black for jacks are better. Totally different than Deuces Wild. Totally different than... Many of the, the other games for blackjack are totally different than three card poker, and there are hundreds of different table games out there. Now, sometimes they're only at five casinos in the country, and that might be one that you come across accidentally or not so accidentally. But you have to be familiar with that game in order to know what you're looking at. Now, I mean, well, like, I don't know Mississippi yeah. Stud at all. And so if a, if I'm looking at a game and they're doing something different in Mississippi Stud, which happens to be player's advantage by accident, I wouldn't know it because I don't know Mississippi Stud at all. 
but so when I first, the first time I went to Moscow to play, uh, this is Moscow, Idaho. Uh, no, this was uh, in, this was Moscow, Russia. Uh, uh, they had a game. I forgot what they were calling it, but the most popular game in the casino was uh, there's a game currently called Lunar Poker, and this was sort of Lunar Poker. It's kind of you're, um, well, it's almost like video poker. You're dealt five cards, uh-huh. and uh, you can uh, draw a card. You could pay. You could put up an extra bet and throw a card away and get another card, and then the dealer has a hand, and you can pay to make the dealer draw another card. And you know, anyway, it. I just looked at the game and said, "Boy, it looks like there's something here," but. This is not an easy game to analyze, and and I didn't know people at the time that I could call that could analyze this game. You know, I mean, I did call some people I knew and said, hey, this is what it is. What do you think? You know, um, but it turned out it was sort of too complicated to... And the thing that was unbelievable about this game was if you wanted to play multiple spots... They would just deal the cards face up. So if you played six spots, you had thirty cards exposed. You, you know that you could look at before you start drawing them, and I, it was crazy. And, and at the same time, it was standard in there to offer a ten percent loss rebate on roulette. So you could play roulette with a ten percent loss rebate. You know. Um, so I may not have known off the top of my head what the edge was or how to play or whatever, but I knew that it was worth further investigation. That was the point, right? I knew. So so I may go into a casino and find a game I've never seen before. I think I'll have a pretty good idea whether it's possible the game will be vulnerable or not. Um, but even if I have no idea, I can at least gather all the information possible about the game and then talk to, you know, some gearheads and let them tell me whether the game is valuable or not. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't always know what I'm looking at. But uh, a lot of times I'll know there's potential. Yeah, years of experience and uh, years of conversations. Um I mean, now one of your friends who have mentioned his name a lot is James Grossgene, who would be extremely good at analyzing those kind of games. That's true. Yeah, I didn't know him at the time. Um, and uh, a former co-host of this show, Michael Shackelford, also analyzes games. I would, uh, if I would not put him in Grossgene's league, but he's good. And uh, if he, if if he was your only source, it would be a good source because he's uh, he's very good at that. All right, we have beaten up our learning curve in various games. Uh, this has been fun, Richard. Yeah. If we ever give up these games and take up some others, we should try this again. <laughs> right, right. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Richard. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day.